your news there there is a case that you see that reminds us of the importance of who is sitting on the bench and the importance of making sure that we have judges who are ethical and reflect our democratic values. So I just want to say thank you to everybody who's giving up a little piece of your Saturday on a long holiday weekend to come here and do this. It's really important. Thank you to the judges who are here to present and, and seek our endorsement or just introduce themselves because they'll be seeking our endorsement in the future. I think that's great. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thank, thank you, Meg. Um, just a couple of housekeeping pieces. Uh, as you probably heard, we are recording the meeting. So if you don't want to be seen or heard, mute yourself and turn off your camera. Um, uh, we'll be giving five minutes for the judges to speak and then 10 minutes for questions and answers um, of the candidates that are running. Uh, the candidates that aren't running, we'll just have five minutes to speak. Um, and then otherwise, uh, currently you're allowed to mute, unmute yourself. We ask that you please don't unmute yourself unless you're called on. If you do, we will change that so that uh, nobody can unmute yourself and we'll have to. Um, if you have a question, please try and raise your hand using the reactions button, the raise hand button on Zoom. That's the easiest way for us to see you. Uh, we'll call on you in the order that hands are raised. Um, unfortunately, it's more likely that we'll see the raise hand button people first. If you are physically raising your hand, we'll try and find you, but I can't guarantee it. Um, and then uh, you'll have, you know, try to keep your, your uh, question to about a minute. Um, and if you've already spoken or asked a question, we'll, we'll first choose anybody that hasn't spoken or asked a question before going back to somebody a second time. Uh, so those are the rules, the regulations. Um, also the chat usually is uh, for our forums, we turn the chat off um, just because we find that it distracts people from hearing from the candidates. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes people get into little arguments and stuff. So we just like to avoid that during the forums as much as we can. But you are welcome to chat. Uh, the hosts, myself, Meg, and Susan from DID, who has graciously uh, agreed to be our timekeeper. Um, you can chat us, and if we see it um, and it's worth amplifying, then we will amplify it. Um, so yeah, that's all I got. Oh, uh, I'd also like to thank Richard and Mar, who aren't here, and uh, Tony Hoffman for helping us put this together. Without you guys, we would not have been able to do this. So thank you so much for your hard work. And Tony, I'll thank you in advance for the uh, hard work you'll be doing when we get to the voting uh, for, for our club. And I guess it's worth mentioning, um, VID will be staying on this link after the call uh, to have our endorsement meeting. Um, Meg, I don't know if you wanna to speak to what DID is going to be doing. DID will, we will also be having an endorsement meeting. We have a separate link. And if you don't already have the link, go to our website, didnyc.org uh, did and RSVP, that all rhymes, to the event and get the Zoom. And that endorsement meeting will be for DID members and only DID voting eligible members will be able to vote for the endorsements. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And then in addition, in VID's endorsement meeting, in addition to endorsing the judges, will be uh, picking and endorsing judicial delegates and alternates as well. So please do attend that meeting. Uh, it shouldn't take too long. Uh, we're estimating about 30 minutes. Um, and uh, this meeting is pared down from what it was originally because people have either dropped out or uh, aren't coming or... Uh, um, so yeah, so it, should, it shouldn't take too, too much of your time is what we're trying to say, but please do join us afterwards for our endorsement meetings. Um, and we're still a little bit ahead of schedule, but I think we'll be all right. If need be, we'll uh, take a little break in the middle. But um, Meg, do you have anything else to add or should we get started? The only thing I was gonna, um, there is one judge on who I believe is not running this year, but um, didn't, I didn't give her uh, a spot. And if we have a couple of minutes, we might give Anna, Mikhaleva, and I apologize if I am not pronouncing your name correctly. Five minutes, just to introduce herself if we have, since we have a couple minutes. Sure, yeah, if we, if we have time uh, uh, after Dana, we will, Perfect. or in between, if, if they're not here on time, we'll get to Anna. Um, all right, cool, so without further ado, oh, and as I mentioned, you'll have five minutes to speak, so just keep that in mind. Uh, but without further ado, we'll start out with uh, Austin D'Souza. 
welcome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Tony, um, Meg, Cam, and all my friends for putting this forum together. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Good afternoon, DID, VID, Grand Street, and downtown family. Many of you know me, uh, but for those who don't, my name is Al Austin De Souza. I'm a father, a husband, a leader in the New York bar, and your downtown neighbor for over a decade. I'm running for judge because I want to continue helping everyday New Yorkers in the best way that I can. I've dedicated my entire career to public service because everyday New Yorkers deserve to be represented by compassionate, hardworking and talented attorneys. I started my career working for the New York City Law Department, handling thousands of cases. I litigated cases in civil court, the same court that I'm trying to get onto the bench, and for Supreme Court in Brooklyn. I was promoted to senior counsel and trial attorney in Manhattan and tried some of the most complex jury trials in the state. For the last five years, I've been Judge Fabiola Soto's law clerk in the Court of Claims and in Bronx Supreme Court, we work on the most important issues facing New Yorkers today. Cases where children have been sexually assaulted and civil rights cases where people have spent decades of their lives in prison for crimes they've never committed. As a civil court candidate, I bring with me a perspective that's different from many candidates. I have made it my life's work to help underprivileged people because I was heavily influenced by my experiences as a poor immigrant from India. My family immigrated to the US when I was five years old. We faced some of the challenges that many immigrants face, but also some that were especially harsh. In school, classmates called me and my brothers Gandhi boys. They said we smelled like curry. They chased us through the streets of our own Queens neighborhood and beat us up. Racial injustice isn't something that I just read about. It's something that I've lived. These experiences have made me sensitive to work for, uh, to help people who are treated like they're second class and like they don't matter. I took these negative experiences and turned them into positive action. Before law school, I worked in politics to help defeat George W. Bush on the John Kerry campaign. I worked for Emily's List, helping pro-choice women Democrats get elected. I worked for the governor of Washington state, making sure that public unions receive the benefits that they fought for. Since becoming a lawyer, I've mentored high school inner city students of color. I have fought to make sure that the law department hired and promoted underrepresented attorneys. And in, rec in recognition for my work, the chief judge of the state, Janet DeFiori, appointed me as a commissioner to the Franklin H. Williams Judicial Commission to fight racism in our court system. I spearheaded the relaunch of the special master's program here in Manhattan. Uh, to, it's a mentorship program that brings together volunteer attorneys to assist justices in Supreme Court. They are all attorneys of color, LGBTQ+, women, disabled, and other underrepresented attorneys. This program will make your lives easier because you will have diverse attorneys who are talented, trained, and ready to run for judge for years to come. I'm a leader of a number of bar associations, including the South Asian Bar Association, where I am president and the New York County Lawyers Association and the City Bar. I work very hard to make sure that the New York Bar is an inclusive and culturally competent community. If given the privilege to serve as a judge in New York City Civil Court, I will bring to bear my life lessons to make sure that everyone who appears in my court receives the compassion, courtesy, and respect that they deserve. That is why I was found most highly qualified by two judicial, independent judicial screening panels this year. Many of you know me for the work I've done in our downtown community. We've passed Wait, animal rights legislation at VID. We've worked to make our streets pedestrian friendly at Grand Street. And in my home club of DID, we've done it all. For five years ago, we launched the Judicial Task Force to fundamentally change how we evaluate Supreme Court justices. We work to elect progressive leaders like Chris Marte and Eric Botcher and many others. I've joined you in every major fight for our community. Although I will not be running for the second judicial district or county seat this year, I will be asking for your support for civil court judge very soon. Thank you. Thanks so much, Austin. Um, and since Austin isn't running this year, we're not gonna do questions and answers. 
really appreciate you coming by uh, to speak to everybody. It means a lot. Um, and uh, just a reminder to the judicial candidates, um, as Austin did, please make sure to uh, specify what, what you're running for, or what you plan on running for, uh, you know, surrogate civil, which district, um, and we'll do our best to announce as well. Um, so again, thank you, Austin. Um, next up we have is Andrea Krugman here. I am here. Excellent. Thank you. For actually, coming. I'm not here. I'm actually in London. So I'm going to make this very fast. Sure. Sure. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Andrea Krugman. I am so honored to be speaking to all of you. And I thank you for inviting me to introduce myself to DID, VID, and all the downtown clubs. Um, this is my first official year as a judicial candidate, and I was honored to have been reported out of the judicial screening panel, although I am not seeking a seat this year. Um, you will see me in the future. Uh, professionally, I've been a plaintiff's personal injury attorney for almost 25 years and have focused my career on employment discrimination cases, sexual harassment, police brutality, labor law, and general negligence cases. Um, I am also a volunteer in the small claims court as an, as an arbitrator and have basic and advanced mediation training for the New York Peace Institute. Um, I was born in Brooklyn and I have lived in New York um, my entire life. I currently am on the Upper East Side, although I've lived in Battery Park City and the West Village and Hell's Kitchen and I've worked around Union Square for more than 20 years. So the entire city has been my home. And in this wonderful city, I am raising two teen girls on my own after the death of their dad. And in my practice and in my personal life, I've seen how important the courts can be in helping those who have suffered indignities and unfair accusations, discrimination, as well as helping families in crisis and individuals facing homelessness and also navigating the city's mental health resources. But in all of my years of practice, the most rewarding has been sitting as a small claims court arbitrator. We're really helping the people on a very individual level. Um, and that has sort of led me to uh, seek a judicial seat. So as you learn more about me, I hope to gain your support and earn the honor of joining the judiciary and having the opportunity to serve the people of this great city and meeting all of you in the near future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, appreciate you as well taking time out of your uh, London trip. To, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Talk to us. Enjoy. Enjoy. Uh, time is. Enjoy dinner. Thank there. you. Yep, Thanks. <laughs> um, so next up, we have Dana Catanzaro. Um, Dana, if you're here, please unmute yourself. I am here. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. And uh, thank you for being here on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Dana Catanzaro. Uh, though I am not seeking an endorsement at this time, I did want to uh, meet all of you to uh, introduce myself. I'm so honored to have been reported out of the panel this year, and I'm extremely excited to continue on this journey towards the civil court bench. Uh, just to give you a little more about my, um, my legal career, I'm a partner at my law firm, uh, where I'm a proud member of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Um, I'm a litigator. I specialize in construction litigation, personal injury litigation, and I supervise a team of attorneys and train associates at the firm. Uh, I've been practicing in New York City courts my entire career, and even before it, uh, while I was a full-time law student in downtown Manhattan, I had a part-time job interning at a firm that did criminal defense work, matrimonial work, landlord tenant, um, among, of, among other items. So, um, you know, I quickly learned how to navigate the courthouses uh, very early on, yeah, often okay. filing papers uh, in the courthouses in between classes. Uh, since then, I've litigated hundreds of matters. I've represented private corporate clients and I handle cases from inception through trial. Um, I'm at home in the courtroom. And one of my greatest joys of what I do is working with other attorneys, with pro se litigants, with my clients to bring each case to a resolution. Uh, tell you a little bit more about my personal background. Um, I was born in Manhattan. I grew up in Brooklyn and have been in Manhattan for most of my adult life. Um, I'm taking this next step 
because it's it's the best way for me to do what I enjoy most, spend my time in court and help people. Uh, my grandfather emigrated to Brooklyn from Italy. And though he could not afford to send his five children to college, he was the one who really inspired me to uh, per pursue academic achievements and advanced degrees. So I'm the first lawyer in my family. Um, and to honor my grandfather and my heritage, I became an active member of the Colombian Lawyers Association, which is the Italian Lawyers Association here in Manhattan. And three years ago, I became one of the first, uh, one of the youngest presidents of the association. And I was just sworn in for my third term as president. In this role, I have collaborated with many bar associations across the city, putting forth continuing legal education seminars, creating networking uh, opportunities for attorneys, for law students, um, and bringing people together during COVID, uh, albeit virtually when, when we were told to be apart. Um, I also connect with people through music. I have been singing my entire life. And during law school, I joined the New York City Bar Chorus's uh, City Bar Chorus Committee. I was the chair of that committee about 10 years ago. And this is a chorus made of lawyers, law students, judges, legal secretaries, and others. And we perform for New York City residents. Uh, during the, my years on the board and as president, we added performance venues across the city. We began performing at Covenant House for teens, um, at the Sage Center for LGBTQ seniors, uh, we continue to perform at homeless shelters, nursing homes, AIDS and cancer residences, senior residences, et cetera. And we've also raised profits, uh, raised funds with our profits for um, the nonprofit organizations of the New York City Bar Association. Um, I've also, another way in which my personal and professional experience have converged is with my involvement with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, New York City chapter. After seeing the impact of various mental health struggles and substance abuse struggles within my family, I became involved with fundraising for the New York City chapter of AFSP many years ago. I'm now proudly co-chairing their new advocacy committee uh, where I can use my legal knowledge to work with other volunteers and improve access to resources for those in crisis, um, such as introducing legislation that would pro provide funding for a 988 number, uh, which would be similar to 911 um, and provide easy access to care for individuals facing a mental health crisis. Um, I, could, I could go on, but uh, I know my time is almost up and um, it is a Saturday. So uh, I just wanna say thank you again for taking time to get to know me a bit better. I will leave my email address and phone number uh, in the chat below. I'd be happy to talk to anyone one-on-one -on -one, uh, so you can get to know more about me and I can get to know more about you. And um, I look forward to speaking to you more. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dana. Appreciate you coming by and introducing yourself to the clubs and all of our members. Um, all right. So next up, we have uh, Lisa Sokoloff, who is running for Civil Court District 3. Um, so uh, for this portion, we will have questions and answers. So uh, it'll be five minutes to, uh, for, for the candidates to introduce themselves and then 10 minutes for Q&A. And just a reminder, please try and use the hand raise tool in the Zoom. That's the best way to get called on. We, will, uh, we ask that you try and uh, stick to one minute for, for your question. And we'll ask ev everybody, we'll be allowed to speak once before we go back and allow people to speak or ask follow-ups. Um, all right, so with, with that, Lisa, please take it away. Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Sokoloff. Many of you know me because of my pursuit of becoming an elected Supreme, but today I'm here to ask you um, for your support as I seek re-election to my civil court seat. I am in my 10th and final year of my term. Uh, throughout my time on the court, um, I've made changes in every single part that I've been in for the benefit of the litigants and the attorneys who appear before me. For instance, uh, when I was in criminal court, um, I pioneered greeting all of the defendants by name and the pronoun by which they requested to be referred. I also uh, work closely with supervised release when it was a pilot program. We had an 83% success rate, much higher um, than bail. I also was known in criminal court for my use of programs, which help people 
um, deal with underlying program problems so that they didn't come back to court. Uh, after criminal court, I went to civil and I was put in a special part that was consumer debt and pro se or self-represented lit litigants uh, for a year. It was a pilot program also. And in that part, I put together a special allocution so that those who were self-represented could really understand what they were asked to, um, when what they were agreeing to when they were stipulating to resolve a case. Thereafter, I was assigned, I became acting supreme and I was assigned to the transit authority part uh -huh. where, where I pioneered a settlement unit. Um, in, in my settlement part, the first year, I settled 10% of my cases and probably would have settled more if the TA hadn't run out of money. Um, after um, two and a half years in the transit part, I went to guardianship. Um, guardianship is really um, God's work. We're taking care of people who are threatened with physical abuse, um, financial exploitation, and food and housing insecurity. In guardianship, I realized that there were not enough uh, people, attorneys on the appointment list um, who were of color. And I conceived and helped start the Guardianship Diversity Initiative, which seeks to bring in more people of color, bilingual individuals, um, members of the LBGTQ um, uh, community, and um, and, and also disabled attorneys, uh, because it's very important to the people who come before us that they can, um, they can see people like them. Uh, finally, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, me personally, um, like some of the people before you. I, I, I have been a bar leader. I was the president of the New York Women's Bar and the Jewish Lawyers Guild. I was also a longtime officer or, or executive member of Network of Bar Leaders, Judges and Lawyers Breast Cancer Alert. My entire life, I've been a mentor, helping people, mostly women and people of color, um, perfect their practice. I've had over um, 70 interns over the years and helped them on to great jobs and better jobs. And last year I was recognized by the New York State Bar with the Kay Crawford Murray Award for a distinguished career and a, and a uh, demonstrated commitment um, to mentoring of women and people of color. 30 seconds. I would just ask you for your support as I run for re-election for my civil court seat in the third municipal district. I think the only club that is part of my district that is attending this forum would be DID. No, VID, excuse me, VID. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you so much. much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, always great to hear from you. Uh, so please get those hands up. Let's get some questions for Lisa. Um, and we're going to start off every uh, question and answer session with the same question. Uh, and that is, what is the role of New York's elected judiciary in perpetuating mass incarceration and without making any commitment about a comment about a specific case? How would that inform your judicial philosophy? I don't like to talk about, um, I don't want to say anything that would cause me to have to be, to recuse myself. Um, and uh, I think that question might be close to that area, but I will tell you um, that in my three years in the criminal, on the criminal bench in um, Manhattan, I was the lowest bail setter, many, many types of, um, uh, misdemeanors I did not set bail on because 
Um, most of the people who came before me could not even afford uh, the lowest amount of bail. Um, and um, I'm very aware of uh, what's going on in the jails of this city. I have toured them. Um, and um, the first time I was at Rikers, I actually saw someone who I had put in. And that was a very, very upsetting thing for me. Um, and I, I was very well aware of the conditions there. Uh, I, I, I think um, many of the defenders have been on panels that I've gone before. And um, I think both the defenders and the DA support me um, because um, I try always to make the best uh, determination. I hope that satisfies your question. Yes, thank you, Lisa, I appreciate it. Um, David, we have David, then Jen, then E.E. E. Keenan. So first up, David. It's good to see you. First of all, thank you for all the work you do on the bench in support of uh, criminal justice work uh, and your work on setting, you know, work against bail, um, all of that are very appreciative. You mentioned supervised release, and I, I'm interested because you said that you had over an 80% success rate with supervised release, and I saw the Office of Court Administration released a study that really panned supervised release and said that there was a lot of reoffending going on. And I'm trying to sort of get to the bottom of what's going on with that. Do you have any, any idea of what's happening there? Well, when I was uh, working with supervised release, I was in the felony part, the felony waiver part waiting. That's where people charged with, with felonies go um, awaiting grand jury action. Um, and so when I was there, it, the program was different. It was opened up subsequently, several years after that, um, to misdemeanors and other types of cases. So, and I also think that it also depends on who's, who's receiving those cases. I will say that supervised release told me that when I was on the bench, um, things were more effective because I really explained it to those people who had been sent to supervised release, how compliance was very important. Um, so I really don't know. I mean, I, I still um, arraign cases. I have seven of them this year um, and uh, seven ar arraignments on uh, holidays and uh, weekend days. And I still use it. I think it's an excellent tool but I'm not as familiar with other people who are still in criminal um, because I don't get that type of information. Thanks guys. Uh, next up we have E.E. Keenan. I'm sorry if there, if I, I should know your name and don't. You're muted, you're muted. There, uh, are you able to hear me, Cam? Yeah, I got you. Do you go by E.E. E. or do you go by Yeah, yeah, E.E. E. Okay, okay. okay. Hi. Hi, uh, Judge Sokoloff. How are you? Thanks for being here. Um, and thanks for your public service. Um, I, I, I just wanted to ask you a bit more about the diversity guardianship program. And if you could tell us a bit more about your work on that. Well, I, I, I'd been in guardianship about six, seven months, and I realized I didn't have that many African Americans um, available to accept appointments. Um, and, you know, there are some very big high money guardianship cases and I wasn't able to give them any of those. And there are other cases where you need people of a certain background uh, for cultural sensitivity. And um, so I reached out to the New York Women's Bar Elder Law Chairs and asked them if they would administer the program because you need to have that. Then I reached out to my colleagues at the time Tatanisha James um, and Mary Rosado, and then Carol Sharp later came in. They all agreed to participate. And we launched in New York County in December of, was it 20 or 21? Um, 20. And then um, after that, I reached out the all the guardianship judges um, from uh, Westchester to um, the bottom of Long Island, we have a round table and we meet three to four times a year. And I brought that to the round table 
everyone thought it was a great program, especially since we had been very successful in New York County. And we did launches in, in um, Queens, Brooklyn, Richmond, Bronx. We've already brought in, I'd say about 75 new practitioners. And we're not, we're not leaving them out to hang on the laundry line. Um, not only do we assign them a mentor, so they have someone to go to to ask those stupid questions, but um, we're also um, doing educational programs to help them where they'll get free CLE credit. So hopefully we're gonna bring in a lot more um, wonderful people into the practice. And there were plenty of actually um, African-Americans that I didn't know about because there's no way for them to say, yes, I'm an African-American, but they came to these events and launches and introduced themselves and they're all now getting um, many, many appointments. So um, I think it's been a, a resounding success and I'm extremely proud of it. Um, so. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, next up, we have John Ball. Hi, Jonathan. You're muted, you're muted. I think. Yeah, you're oh, hi. Um, yeah, good to see you. Uh, question about guardianship. Um, uh, as Just for the general public, often a guardian is appointed who is not a family member or so on by the court. Uh, it's come up in guardian uh, forums that uh, in the in the during in the occasions when someone is unhappy with the guardian who's been appointed after say six months or a year of a guardianship, uh, that person often doesn't have would have to bring a petition to court to get the guardian changed and doesn't have a way of finding an attorney or understanding what the process would be. And this is a this is a, a real problem. Um, uh, is that something you're aware of? And do you have any suggestions? Um, it has happened once or twice, actually happened in a case where I pointed the grandchildren and the grandmother wasn't happy. And she wrote to us, um, uh, she emailed the court saying she wasn't happy. And so I reappointed her attorney um, to move for a new guardian and um, that, that is being brought to the court. There's uh, litigation going on and we've had it in a couple of cases where a relative is not happy with the work of a guardian and writes to the court, they, they, they do have to bring a petition to change the, but it's not a difficult thing. I mean, it can be brought pro se. Um, if the court knows about it, I'll assign an attorney to do so. So um, it, it does happen from time to time, but it's very, very rare. And sometimes you'll see something um, that a guardian has fallen down and that person will never receive an appointment again, at least not from me. Awesome, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Jonathan uh, and Rick Braun, you're next. Yeah, hi, Lisa. How did you hi. handle, not much time um, left. How, how did you handle, sent, how do you handle um, when you have, uh, when you're in arraignments and previously, how did you handle sentencing and misdemeanor drug possession cases? Um, again, uh, how did I do it? All right. Um, well, first of all, uh, many of you probably don't know this, but if you get um, certain, if, if a person pleads to certain marijuana charges or used to plead to that, um, that would prevent them from getting um, um, uh, scholarship money or um, loans uh, to go to college. So um, I would try to negotiate that with the DA so they wouldn't take that plea, but an analogous plea um, because that creates an entire, um, it perpetuates um, issues of, um, I hate to say it, but Jim Crow because most of the people being um, sentence with those um, types of uh, crimes were um, young men of color. Thanks guys. Um, so thank you, Lisa, for coming by and introducing yourself. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to the, everybody that's asked questions so far. Um, awesome, so we will uh, uh, follow up after our meeting. 
Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Bye bye. Uh, so next up, we have Hillary Ging Gingold, who's running for surrogate court. Um, so please unmute yourself. There we go. How's it going? So uh, just Good. a reminder, uh, you'll have five minutes to speak, then 10 minutes for Q&A, and there will be a timer running. Um, the name is Blue Sky Timer. It's somewhere on here. So you, oh, yep, left for me. Uh, so please take it away. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hillary Gingold, and I want to thank all of you for this invitation to speak today. And I want to let you know that I am very honored to report out that not only have I been found most highly qualified by the New York County Independent Judicial Screening Panel to be the next surrogate, but this week on Tuesday night, I was, vote, I was voted by a virtually unanimous vote chosen to be New York County's candidate for surrogate. I wanna thank your district leaders for voting for me and the district leaders throughout the county who took the time to come to that meeting and, and vote for the candidates. Since 2018, I've been honored to be an elected civil court judge here in New York County. But before that, I began my career as a social worker, helping elderly and disabled adults uh, access benefits and housing through Catholic charities. I realized that there was a need for advocacy on behalf of the most vulnerable, so I became an attorney and I spent 25 years in private practice, devoted primarily to trust and estates and guardianships. But I've never forgotten my roots as a social worker. In addition to my practice, I ran a not-for-profit organization dedicated to protecting seniors and families from predatory lenders at the height of the foreclosure crisis. They were people who were literally being thrown out of their homes and into the street. I was recognized by the New York State Bar Association as pro bono attorney of the year for New York State for those efforts. Before I was elected as a civil court judge, I served as a principal law clerk until the chief judge of New York State asked me to join the state's excellence initiative, providing access to justice as a special referee assigned to handle a backlog of over 6,000 cases. In addition to my career as a social worker, attorney, principal law clerk, special referee, and now as a judge, I have been and continue to be a bar leader. I've been past president of Queens County Bar uh, and very, very active as an executive board member to many, many different bar associations. I am today a bar fellow for the New York State Bar Foundation, which is their charitable uh, branch that uh, dedicates its time and money and efforts to helping women and children. I'm also especially proud to have been served as president of the Network of Bar Leaders, which is an association representing the interests of more than 60 different minority bar associations, and where I continue today to mentor young attorneys. As a judge, I have a thorough understanding of how court runs, and most importantly, how it should run. People are entitled to an answer as soon as possible. Even the dead are entitled to, to lay in peace that their final wishes are carried out by the court as quickly as possible. I'm a hands-on judge and I have a reputation for my ability to resolve disputes equitably and fairly. I'm not an ivory tower judge. Uh, you may be surprised to know that I am just as comfortable at the window of the help center at 111 Center Street on the first floor of the courthouse as I am in the courtroom. I am committed to providing public service to lawyers and litigants alike. And like many of you sitting here today, I have taken care of my husband's parents until their deaths, my own mother, and now my, I'm dealing with caring for my 92-year-old father as he ends the, end of, nears the end of his own life and dealing with dementia and a seriously diminished cap physical capability. I think of him every time I make a ruling that impacts litigants, and I believe that surrogates court should be run as a we and not as a who or a us and a them. We are the court and we're here to serve. Uh, and I believe that I can do that job with honor and dignity on behalf of the people of the city of New York. Unlike any other court in the state, there is no training to be a surrogate. There's no judge school. And I believe I have the requisite background, judicial demeanor to serve the citizens of New York City and New York County from day one as surrogate. A little bit of a background just before we go. I am on a personal note, I am married 38 years. I have two adult children, both of whom serve the public and are active in, in their communities. I believe in it, I practice it, and I'm here to continue it as your next surrogate. And I thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, personally, I always love the term adult children. Uh, yeah, they're forever <laughs> my children. Yeah. 
Um, great. So please get those hands up if you have questions. Um, I see one already. Uh, and then, you know, if, if we miss you or you're unable to raise your hand and we don't see you, please uh, shoot me a message in the chat and I'll see that. Uh, so first up, we have E.E. E. Keenan. Good afternoon, Judge Hingle, and thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your day to be with us and for your, your ongoing service um, on the court. Uh, what are the attributes that make for a good judicial demeanor, and do you have them? For me, the, the attributes are that you have the ability to, one, recognize your own preconceived notions of when people appear before you, because we are all human beings. And the second part is to be able to acknowledge it and put it to the side and listen to the facts and really look at what is being said and listen to what's not being said. It's very important to uh, take into account everything and make a decision pretty quickly. Uh, and it's something that I think in this day and age, courts are moving towards mediation and it's going to be mandatory and it needs to be mandatory for many, many instances so that people can get to court and get in and out quicker than later. You know, there's the saying justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, for example, I had a woman uh, this week uh, who's a tenant in a, runs a Dominican beauty parlor uptown and she hadn't paid her rent in two years because of COVID. I worked it out with the landlord and I helped them come to an agreement. I had them come back to court twice, both remotely and in person. I had a Spanish interpreter and they worked it out. The landlord gave her a six month break on her rent. And I, I'm very proud of that, that we were able to accomplish it, that the business stayed in place. The landlord gets his rent and she gets to continue her business and move on with her life. That's to me, judicial demeanor. Thank you. Um, I forgot to ask the uh, question I'm asking everybody, which is, what is the role of New York's elected judiciary in perpetuating mass incarceration? And without making any com com comment about a specific case, how would that inform your judicial philosophy? Well, I sat in criminal court for two years when I first became a judge, and I was the primary felony arraignment judge. And I was known for not setting bail and using um, rehabilitative and uh, rehabilitative services in many instances, as well as supervised release. In fact, I was asked to pioneer their conference part. I resolved 2200, a backlog of over 2,200 cases of uh, reduced felonies and misdemeanors. And I did that through uh, dismissing cases when I looked at the charges and saw that people did not have enough to charge this person and keep those charges open. Because when you walk around with an open case, you can't get financing, you can't go to college, you can't get a job. And I was committed to seeing that those cases get resolved as quickly as possible. So especially in particular, young people can go on with their lives. Thanks so much. Uh, Rick, Rick Braun, you're next. Hi, nice to see you again. Hi, Glad how are you? you? Came... Good, Glad to hear you came out Good. of the panel. It yeah, me too. Smile. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, having having uh, gone through judges school, which was a full week, actually, before starting in civil court, it was I found it to be a very valuable experience. And I'm, I was distressed and disturbed to hear you say there's no judges school for surrogates. Uh, I think that's really a failing of the system. Um, what can you what do you what do you intend to do about that? Uh, well, I, I'll tell you, I think, I, I, that's a good question. There is no judge school. Well, first of all, I don't even know if it's a failing of the system because when I became a judge, if you become a civil elected civil, uh, you go to judge school for 10 days now. And then when you go to criminal court, they don't hand you the gavel and the robe and say, good luck to you. You sit, you, you follow other judges, you second chair them for at least uh, you know, two, three months. Uh, I sat in drug court and I became the backup for drug court and youth court. And I watched many, I watched many, many hours of other judges on my own time uh, to see how to handle it and to understand all of the dynamics that go into ordering treatment or what have you. And the same, but see for surrogates court, you're right. I, but I have 25 years as a trust and estate attorney. I'm four years on the bench. And at this point, although the law is different in surrogates court and it's a, a procedurally based court, yet you, I, I think that the skills that I have having already been a current judge really enable me to Take, hit the ground running in that particular court, even though there is no judge school. 
Um, I have reached out to the surrogates in the surrounding boroughs and uh, know a lot of them. I know past surrogates, the current surrogate. And so I think keeping in touch with people and knowing that you can reach out to a surrogate and ask a question, another judge is, the, is key. Uh, I have no ego in this job. I wanna do the right thing every day. So if I have to make a phone call and ask someone for an opinion, I, I'm not shy about doing it. But you're right, there is no judge school and I, I want people to understand there's no training. Thank you very much. Uh, next you. up we have Janine Kiley. You're muted. Mute. There you go. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, what resources and leeway would you um, provide to pro se litigants? We do that every day. One of the things that I think has to be done is we have to have a uniform approach. People do very well when they know the rules of the road. They come into the courthouse and you explain to, and I get off the bench every day and I walk over to people. It, it actually can be a little disconcerting for some officers because People come in, they're pro se, and they, they hand a paper. They don't know what to do with that paper. I, we don't have the resources right now uh, in the court system, but my court attorney and I, we are actively in the courtroom helping people figure out what's their next step. When I write a decision, I always tell you what's the next step. And that is, if you give people the information so they know what they now have to do next, they're more successful. Even if they lose their case, they feel that they had their day in court, they were heard. And that's very important, understanding the process. And it's, at this point, when you go into surrogate, I do believe it's the surrogate's job to make sure that everyone who appears knows they were heard and guided appropriately to their resolution. So that's really where I stand. I, I do, I am a very hands-on person, I will say that. Thank you very much. Uh, Susan, Susan Burke. Um, thank you. Um, hi, Judge. If hi. you had a magic gavel, what is one thing you would change about the court system? Oh, that's an easy one. Uh, one of the things that I that is my number one pet peeve, it's more than a pet peeve, I've spoken about it with Justice Canataro, who sits on the uh, Court of Appeals, and I have pleaded to everybody. We are in the greatest city in the world. And yet when people come in, if, for example, in criminal court, if you give someone an order of protection, it comes in Spanish or English. What if you're Russian? I was in Brooklyn, a lot of Russian, a lot of Creole, a lot of other languages. Uh, you go to a foreign country and you can get, or the DMV, and every single instruction from the DMV is in like 10 different languages. And so that, if I had the special gavel, every single piece of paper that comes at it, that's generated by the court, including decisions by judges, would be able to be translated into someone's native language so that they can walk out the door, you know, knowledge is power. And if you have access, that would be my magic wand. Because I've, yesterday I had this woman with this Dominican uh, beauty parlor and I had a fabulous interpreter so she could understand what she was signing. But imagine if she could read it in her own native language, how much better that would be. So she walked out, it was interpreted, but when she looks at it later, she's gonna have to ask someone, you know, maybe her adult son to help her, her adult child, sorry, for those of you like to hear that they're a child, uh, read it again to her. Uh, but what if we gave it to her in her native language? And that to me is the greatest uh, difficulty I have as a judge is that we aren't able to provide this, but we can in the Department of Motor Vehicles. We can for your passport, but we can't in the New York City court system. This to me is the magic gavel wish. Awesome, thanks so much. Are there any other questions? Not seeing any. Well, great job. Thank you so much for joining us. We thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you to, this is a wonderful opportunity. I just wanna thank everybody for giving up their Saturday afternoon for all of us. Take care and be well, everyone. Thank you. All right, so next up, uh, we have Allison Greenfield, who's running for Civil Court District 2. So Good afternoon, Allison. everyone. Hello. Uh, it is such a privilege to be before you today. I see a lot of friendly faces, and I see some faces for the first time, although maybe we've spoken on the phone. Um, I really can't wait till we can do this in person um, and share a glass of cheap Chardonnay together at some point. Um, 
I'm Allison Greenfield. I'm running for the open civil court seat in the second district. I have lived in the second district my entire adult life. Um, unlike many of my fellow candidates, I wasn't actually born in New York City, but as I like to say, I flocked to New York City as soon as it became legally and physically possible. I uh, am originally from South Florida, then because of divorced parents, I moved to the suburbs of Georgia for high school, which was not a good fit for me. So I actually graduated high school early. I came to NYU for college, and I have never, le never looked back. Uh, I moved to the Lower East Side to the second district uh, my sophomore year of college. I lived on Pitt Street. Uh, I've been with the same landlord ever since. Uh, I'm in a fourth floor walk up now on Stanton and Clinton. The second district is my home. It is my community. It is um, what has given me so much over the last 20 years of my life. And I can't think of any better way to give back to the community that has given me so much than to serve it in this judicial court uh, capacity, uh, in the civil court capacity, excuse me. Um, I went to NYU for college. I went to Benjamin and Cardoza School of Law for law school. After that, I worked in the private sector for a few years before I um, left that job to become a trial attorney for the city of New York in its special litigation unit. There, I gained a tremendous amount of experience uh, in all sorts of litigation and uh, particular trial experience. And then about uh, three and a half years ago, I had the most tremendous opportunity to become the principal law clerk to Justice Arthur N. Gorin. Um, you may have seen him in the news a little bit in the last couple of days. We've been quite busy. He is an incredible uh, justice who I have learned so much from. He and I have developed a real sense of mutual respect and trust. And he has given me a lot of responsibility as his principal law clerk that I uh, am very proud of and don't take lightly. And um, I'm gonna go into just a little bit about what my goals in the courtroom would be um, if afforded the opportunity to preside over a civil court part. Uh, the first thing I want to do is, of course, echo what Judge Gingold said, justice delayed is justice denied. And as a city attorney, I once waited over two years for a decision in the Bronx. That's absolutely insane. Um, and I was working for the city who had deep pockets, of course, and could afford to foot the cost and bill of waiting two years for a decision. But I am incredibly cognizant of the fact that if you are a human being, a person, you cannot afford to wait two years to get a decision on your motion. And the waiting period alone could mean that the, it's the end of the case for you because you just don't have the time and resources to keep fighting. So I'm very, very pleased to announce that as Justice and Gorin's law clerk, the average waiting time for a decision in our part is under 30 days, which is uh, less than half the time that the court even suggests slash requires. Um, another thing that is very important to me is um, how we deal with pro se litigants in our courtroom. Uh, with Justice and Gorin's permission, I have instituted a policy that no matter what, if there's a pro se involved in the case, even if we think it's a simple, a simple legal argument that could easily be decided on the papers, we schedule everything for oral argument because we feel it's incredibly important for unrepresented litigants to have time before the judge, to have uh, an opportunity to voice their concerns, to speak about their case, to speak about their facts and the impact that it's having on their life. So even if at the end of the day, they're unhappy with the ultimate result, we really think it's important important that they feel as if they've had an opportunity to meaningfully participate in the process. And the last thing I want to say about my judicial philosophy, which is, I think, the most important, is um, there's always balancing of factors that you use when you're deciding any particular legal issue. You're looking at precedent, you're looking at the parties, you're looking at the unique facts of the case. But also in that balancing of factors, one thing that I think is incredibly important to consider, what would the people who elected me want me to do? And is there any precedent or is there any distinguishing factors and precedent that would allow me to achieve that outcome? Because at the end of the day, I'm here to serve the constituents. I'm here to create justice for the constituents and the citizens of the second district. And along that end, what would make New York City a better place to live? I think that's always something that should be considered in the balancing of factors. I have four seconds left, so I'm gonna lay it there. Thank you. <laughs> Great timing. Thank you very much, Allison. Um, all right, so first I'll ask the question we're asking everybody. 
what is the role of New York's elected judiciary in perpetuating mass incarceration? And without making any comment about a specific case, how would you inform your judicial, how would that inform your judicial philosophy? Uh, absolutely. And without getting in, into specifics about anything that uh, could appear before me in the future, I will say that as a city attorney, I had the um, really difficult experience of visiting Rikers on many occasions. And no one should endure that. I don't care what crime you've been committed or you've been charged with. I don't care what crime you've been convicted of. And Rikers is hell on earth and it's not fit for any human being. So uh, without getting any, any, any into any particulars, I am generally very supportive of Alvin Bragg's policies. I think that um, although it's off to, you know, any new policy, there's hiccups in the beginning and there's things that need to be worked out. I think we really need to power through and not retreat from bail reforms. I think they're incredibly important in creating fairness and equity for all citizens. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'm gonna call on Pete Davies because he hasn't spoken yet. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for your service. Uh, regarding special access to the court, a recent article in the New Yorker highlighted how the amicus briefs are often being used as a tool by lobbyists to gain special access to the court. The article cites various cases with briefs connected to Ginny Thomas, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Recent local cases in our own courts filed by community members at a very high financial cost have exhibited apparent sophisticated lobbying efforts by those submitting amicus briefs for the opposition, where the goal does seem to be special access. Please speak to your experience regarding improper attempts for access and what is being done to assure fundamental fairness. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, we have dealt in my capacity as Justice and Gordon's law clerk with many, many requests to file amicus briefs. And generally, our policy has been that we let at First Amendment, anyone can file anything that they want. However, once it's filed, you have to have a really careful analysis of what to do with it. Is it just something that's been filed so that person has an opportunity to voice their First Amendment right that really shouldn't be considered by the court, one, because of any sort of special interest or ties to it, or two, because it's uh, it's not relevant or uh, it's clearly it's clearly a partisan attempt to influence something politically. Um, but then I think there are amicus briefs that get filed. I can tell you I worked with Justice Ngoran on the Two Bridges Towers case. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it. We were incredibly active in that case. Um, we, try, we tried to stop the two towers. We were ultimately overturned by the first department. Um, but I think it was incredibly important in that case for the community groups to have the opportunity to file amicus briefs because they had a real... Uh, vested interest in the case because it was their home and uh, there were damages that arguably could affect them personally. So I think you have to draw distinctions between the purpose of why an amicus brief is being uh, filed. And while I generally think that permission should be granted freely, what you do with that brief once it's filed uh, is very different um, on a case by case basis. Thank you very much. Uh, next up we have Marianne Rydell. Um, Please. Thanks, Cameron. Hi, Allison. We spoke, but it's nice Hi, to Mary. see your face. So I have a question that is not exactly on point, but it follows up. You talked about the conditions at Rikers Island and how horrific they are. And the two jails in Chinatown have been closed since January of 2021. So it's really two questions. What do we do meanwhile? And what can you do as a judge to protect people um, from the, the growing overpopulation and horror of going to Rikers Island? Uh, I think you really have to work on more alternative options like supervised release with certain conditions. I think that um, unfortunately as a judge, your, hand, your hands can be somewhat tied until we have larger policy action. But I think uh, every, every any person that comes before you, you have the opportunity to assess them, to assess why they're in the situation that they are. If it's really a result of racial injustice or larger unfairness, and you know the punishment should fit the crime. It shouldn't be a one size fits all approach. And I think certainly we need to really consider alternatives um, such as supervised release and things like that. 
Thank you. Uh, Rick Braun, you're next. And Hi, nice Josh. to see you. Nice to see you again. I hope you and Arthur are taking good care of my former courtroom there. We you're are, we are, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and send him and my former court officer, Brenda Jones, my regards. She's um, about to retire, so I certainly will. <laughs> oh, she didn't tell me that. I spoke to her recently. Okay. Um, anyway, question. Um, as you know, often civil court judges are sent to start in either a criminal court or family court. How do you feel about that? And if, in, if you're in civil court and city lawyers appear before you, which will happen, how are we going to handle that? Uh, I'm going to take the second part of the question first and then go backwards. Um, I had a tremendous opportunity working at the city, but one thing that it really taught me, and I think all lawyers can appreciate, you don't always get to choose your clients. And there were certainly many opportunities, many situations where I disagreed with the policy decision that the city was taking. Um, in my capacity as senior counsel, there was only so much I could do to push back, but I encouraged settlement whenever I could. I encouraged alternatives to litigation whenever I could. Um, so I'm certainly not in it with any sort of preconceived notion that the city is calling all the right shots and they're entitled to uh, you know, a leg up. That's absolutely not the case. Um, so I don't think that would be an issue for me at all. As Arthur and Goran's principal law clerk, we've had many city attorneys that appear before us it matters not. Uh, the New York Times used to have a slogan that they've somewhat abandoned in the past, but um, it was without fear or favor. And that's really how I intend to preside over the bench. Um, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if I know you. It doesn't matter if we've been at the same bar associations. You got to call the case as it needs to be called in the interest of fairness and justice. Um, for the first part of your question, Criminal court, although I don't have any direct criminal court experience as a city attorney, I am feel very familiar with criminal procedure because often the criminal prosecution will precede the civil litigation, which is what I was dealing with. Um, and for family court, I don't have any family court experience. I'm gonna be incredibly honest with you, but I have talked to my predecessor in my job now, who's now Judge Waterman, now Judge Waterman Marshall. I'm not sure if the paperwork is in order. Um, and she assured me that judge school uh, really prepared her uh, for family court and to hit the ground running. And I have no doubt, I know judge school is taught by Bert Lipschey, who was a former beloved law school professor of mine. Uh, he's also an advisor to me in my capacity on the Law Secretaries Association. I know that he can get everybody into shape to be prepared on day one. Thanks guys. Uh, next up we have Terry Kuhn. Hi, um, I'll ask quickly, um, what is your position on whether municipalities uh, must be required and in what time frame to, uh, to, to follow or to adhere to laws that are passed by the citizens? Uh, immediately, I think, unless the law carves out some sort of exception for the municipality, the municipality is not, they're a party before the court as anybody else. So unless there's special treatment carved out in the litigation, I don't think there's, there's any special treatment. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Harriet Skidelsky. Thank you. Really nice to meet you. Um, do you bring attorneys into chambers without their clients for private discussions, either with the judge or with yourself? And if so, do you think that's a good idea? Uh, we do often, but we always ask permission of the attorneys um, beforehand. Um, my judge prefers to have the clients in all discussions. And I think that that's uh, the better approach most of the time. Um, oftentimes, there's two schools of thought. One is the client can get away, can get in the way of the legal argument because the emotions are so overpowering. But the flip side of that coin, right, is it's the client that matters. It's the client's case. It's the client's outcome. It's the client's livelihood at stake. So oftentimes by bringing the client in the room with the judge, they feel they have the opportunity to really be a part of the process. So even if they're dissatisfied at some point, it's important that they feel as if the system is working with them and they're a part of it. Awesome, thank you. Um, and E.E. E. Keenan, there's about 15 seconds left. Is your question quick? It's same question uh, as before. 
Um, what are the attributes of good judicial demeanor and do you have them? Uh, yes, I think one of the most important attributes is to understand that they're not just the, the parties before you are not just names on a paper, that these are actual citizens and human beings. And you have to always be cognizant of that as you're going through the long um, you know, uh, procedure of litigation. Um, and I know I'm, I'm now I'm over time, so cut me off if you need to, but uh, there's this longstanding debate between um, judicial philosophy with Justice Sotomayor on one end of the spectrum saying you should always consider empathy and with uh, Justice Roberts on the other end of the spectrum saying you just call balls and strikes. I am on the Justice Sotomayor end of the spectrum. You have to consider empathy. Empathy won't rule the day at the end of the day, but it should certainly should be a consideration. I could give you a lot more to your answer, but I know I'm out of time. So I'm gonna uh, thank you so much. Thank and you. also just say, I, it's been a pleasure speaking with you and I would be absolutely be thrilled to have your endorsement for the second municipal district. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming by. We appreciate it. Um, all right, next up we have Elba Galvin who's running for surrogate court. So please unmute yourself. Oops, sorry, I just muted you by accident. Okay, how's that? Can you hear You're me? Good. Can you hear me? Yes, um, and just so you know, I noticed you came on a, a little bit ago, five minutes to speak, 10 minutes for Q&A, and you'll see a, a timer towards the top. That should help you. I'm sorry, the timer is where? It oh, says I see blue it. sky yeah. timer. I, I see it, thank you. Hi, okay, so first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Um, my name is Elba Galvan, and also I really want to thank everybody who's here as a volunteer who is dedicating their time um, to try to vet the judges that so that we can have the best judges on the bench possible. Um, you're doing that service for all New Yorkers, and uh, it is very much appreciated. So I have been a court attorney referee in surrogates court. Um, Kings County since 2017, which is a large reason uh, for my running in this, in, in this race. Um, I have felt the most fulfillment in my legal career um, in this position uh, as a referee. And, um, I, and that's an over 25 year um, ex uh, uh, legal experience. I've been uh, admitted for over 25 years in, in, in New York. And uh, I began uh, my, uh, I began in law school working for legal aid um, in their criminal defense division uh, and aspired to be a criminal defense attorney. But um, uh, that period in which I graduated was the time when uh, Giuliani uh, did the union busting and ruptured the organization. And so my, um, my gears had to shift and I became an appellate attorney and a civil litigator. And what is so relevant about the fact that I had that sort of very early appellate um, experience is that in surrogate's court, it's sort of a marriage between appellate thinking and real life problem solving. For those who don't know what surrogate's court is and um, what we have jurisdiction over, we basically deal with matters um, that uh, stem from someone's death. So for example, the validity of a will um, or appointing a fiduciary, but we also do guardianships and we also do adoptions. Now in the portion that deals with potential litigation, um, uh, the um, contesting of wills, for example, and um, the contesting of who should be the fiduciary in an um, intestate uh, estate, um, in that portion, there is a, a big role that referees play in, tr in terms of problem solving. So what we try to do in term, uh, to, to try to keep as much generational wealth in the estate is we, uh, with the parties, conduct settlement conferences. And, um, and, and sometimes it takes a number of conferences before we can actually come to a resolution, before the parties can come to a resolution. But every minute, of every one of those conferences is worth it because what's happening is we're avoiding litigation and the expenditure and hemorrhaging of resources, both for the estate and for the court. So ultimately, um, I, this is one of the reasons why I find that work to be so fulfilling. 
but I do want to circle back to the appellate portion because you're probably wondering, well, what does that have to, that kind of problem solving at the trial level, what does that have to do with appellate work? And I can tell you, not a lot of people know this, but surrogate's court does not have a lot of appellate um, precedent. And what that means is that we at the trial level are basically um, preparing the, um, uh, 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 the, the decisions for our colleagues to cite. Oftentimes we're citing uh, you know, the surrogate in Albany or the surrogate in Nassau County. Um, and so you have to be really thoughtful and careful about the decisions that you render because they're not only important to the litigants before you, but they're actually gonna be important to all the surrogates in New York state. So that is um, uh, a portion of the job that I think uh, I'm particularly also attuned to because of my appellate experience and my analytical way of approaching things. Um, so it's an interesting marriage uh, between this trial level problem solving and um, appellate experience. Um, I, I wanna say outside of my legal experience, I have dedicated lots and lots of time to bar associations. I was the president of the Puerto Rican bar, bar Association. I am a uh, two-term president of the National Lawyers Guild, New York City chapter. I am serving on the um, uh, executive committee of the National Lawyers Guild, New York City chapter for years. Um, and uh, I consider myself to be a guild attorney um, in, in that we care about the public and the interest of the public. So, um, so uh, I see that my time is up and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, we really appreciate it. Um, all right, so we're gonna open it up for questions. First one we're asking everybody, uh, what is the role of New York's elected judiciary in perpetuating mass incarceration and without making any comment about a specific case, how would that inform your judicial philosophy? Okay, so in circuits court, we don't deal with mass incarceration, but I do wanna say, in the National Lawyers Guild New York City chapter, we definitely deal with that. And um, we have a lot of um, guild activity uh, around um, trying to stem. And frankly, uh, the guild has, um, uh, has even, there are certain arms of the guild um, on the national level that are uh, suggesting the abolishment of prisons altogether. So, um, uh, but I can say, that um, the, uh, for in terms of my surrogate service and my court service, that question isn't going to be exactly um, relevant. So if you want to ask a, another question, I'm happy to answer it. Well, we're just, it's a standard question we're asking everyone. So, so uh, we'll move on to the, let everyone else ask their questions. Um, yeah, of course. And, and thank you for the response. Uh, e. Keenan, you're first. Well, thank you so much for uh, being with us today and, and giving us your perspectives and, and for your public service. Uh, can you tell us what are the attributes that make for good judicial demeanor and do you have them? So I think the number one attribute of good judicial demeanor is to really understand and embrace that every litigant before you, attorney or um, pro se litigant, deserves respect. And by that, I mean the same respect that you yourself would want. Uh, I feel very strongly that in a courtroom where everyone feels respected and everyone feels heard, that even regardless of the outcome, because not everyone is a winner in a courtroom in terms of uh, an outcome. Some people feel like they, and some people do, lose a particular um, uh, argument or case. But everyone should feel that they have won the attention of the judge, that, you, that the judiciary is paying close attention, that they are being heard, and that they are respected. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Meg. Hi, yeah. Um, my question is, if you had a magic gavel, what would be one thing you would wave your gavel over and change in our judiciary system? Well, if I had a magic gavel, I would want to ensure that everyone had equal access to justice. I don't need to tell probably anybody on this Zoom that there is uh, disparate access to justice depending on economics. It's not that embedded in the laws, it says 
you know, you can't get into court um, if you don't have enough money or what have you, but it's the reality. It's the reality of every fee, of, of representation. It's the reality that not everyone has equal justice, equal access to justice. So if I had a magic gavel, that's what I would change. Awesome, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? Please raise your hand. There is time. Uh, Paul Newell. Oh, just muted yourself back. There you go. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us, Ms. Gallup. Um, uh, if, you, if you are required to make a decision, if the law requires in your interpretation of it to make you to make a decision that results in what you would consider personally an unjust outcome, how do you handle that situation? So the good thing about surrogate's court is that we're a court of equity, meaning we have an extra tool in our toolbox. We get to look for an equitable result specifically uh, even we, we stay within the bounds of the law um, and absolutely that is um, uh, we're a court. However, within the bounds of the law, there is usually a way to make sure that a just end uh, occurs. And certainly that's what I would aspire to do as a surrogate. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have Rick Braun. Yeah, hi, Ms. Galvan. Um, I don't you may have said this, but um, you are Latina? I am. Then my question is, how many Latina surrogates are there in New York City, if any? So in New York City, actually, Rita Maya uh, is uh, a Latina sur right. surrogate. Thank you. So just one. That's it. Just her. Is that uh, in, in Manhattan, there is only one other circuit. <laughs> no, I'm saying, Rita, she's the oh, only. So in Brooklyn, in the there is city no Latina um, in Brooklyn, which is where I work. Um, and in Staten Island, I believe he is not Latino, um, Latinx. Uh, in Queens, uh, also not Latinx. And in uh, the Bronx, we have a Latin Latino. Thank you, Rick, for pointing that out. And thank you, Elva. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, uh, please. I should mention that my mentor um, and uh, a judge who to this day um, uh, mentors me, even though she retired, um, is Margarita Lopez Torres. And um, she is Latina. <laughs> so, <laughs> although she's retired, but she is um, really a a pillar um, to, uh, she's a people's judge and I have learned a lot from her. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure uh, getting to know you um, and hear what you had to say. Uh, just last call, if anybody has questions? Not seeing anybody? Well, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. Of course. All right. So next up we have Edron Bowen who is running for civil court countywide. Uh, Duran, take it away. Hi. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Duran, and <laughs> I am running for countywide um, civil court. I, I do apologize. Um, as some of you are aware, th um, last Thursday, the district leaders met, and by unanimous proclamation, um, I don't know, anointed, appointed, I'm not sure <laughs> what the word is, elected, uh, <laughs> voted um, me as, as a Democratic Party nominee. And I'm still pinching myself. I'm still somewhat overwhelmed. And so I'm really focusing my energy into not turning into a blathering mess. <laughs> so I do apologize, but it's particularly hard here because, you know, last cycle, which was my first time, you know, running, you know, my campaign as it was began here. Um, you know, when I, when I came here, here last year, I knew pretty much nothing. 
And, you know, there were other candidates who were like name dropping and talking about people they worked with and did stuff with. And I'm going, I know none of you. <laughs> All I had was, hi, I'm Duran, and this is who I am, and this is what I've done, and this is what I'm about. And you all listened to me. You actually cared about the merits of me and what I did and what I know and what I hope to do. And, you know, my very first endorsements <laughs> were you all. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> It, it really changed my campaign then. I mean, I was getting phone calls and emails and texts from people. I didn't know who they were. And I was getting them even before you all officially announced your endorsements. <laughs> and I, you know, I can't tell about alternative universes or something, but I have a hard time believing that if you took the equation of you all out, that I would be in the same position now. And, you know, it's funny because you know, Suzanne Jacobson is working with me this cycle. And after the district leaders voted, she texted me a little joke because I'm always talking about, you know, look, I do feel humbled. And she said, you don't have to keep saying that. But when the, something that's a dream looks like it could be a reality, you are overwhelmed. And I am so sorry. Please don't record this. But <laughs> um, it is being recorded, but it's okay. My love. Um, you know, after the district leaders met, she she told she she called me as a joke, and she sort of said jokingly, "You don't have to be so humble anymore." But you know, I think the thing about being here is, I have to be. You know, I'm a logical person. I am a mathematician. I and I do understand logically that from a pure statistical numerical basis, I shouldn't be here. So I understand that. <laughs> There are people who write me off and people like me from the moment of our birth. And the thing that was so special and so hard and so touching for me being here is that you all, you all saw me and you all put the strength of your convictions and your beliefs and your hope for a truly fair and just judiciary. You put that behind me this Joe Schmo who knew no one. And I am eternally grateful for that. Um, so, you know, I'm listening, like, you know, Eliza Orleans, who I do at Legal Aid Society and I've known since 2010, 2011. She was telling me I should be a judge back in my second, third year as an attorney. You know, the David, David Weiss, David Sifford, I mean, you guys, you know, I think I saw Cameron, you, I've talked to all of you and you guys have been ridiculously supportive. District leaders who I've talked to multiple times, Jennifer Hoppy, Victoria, <laughs> Louis Berman, you know, I think I saw Janine, I'm not sure, I think I saw Janine on there. I mean, you all talked to me, you all supported me, you guys, you know, I can't begin to thank you all. And particularly, I have to thank Paul Newell, who, I mean, literally, I'm here because Paul Newell all but basically threatened my life if I did not become a judge. He dared me <laughs> not to be running. So thank you on, I, I, I haven't said anything. I was a mathematician, I went to law school. I went. I was at Legal Aid Society as a trial and appellate attorney, then a court attorney for a trial judge, and now I'm a court attorney for an appellate judge, for appellate court. Um, I'm, a, I'm a panel judge, um, court attorney for all the judges. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, I would love your endorsement and support again. I'd like to be batting a thousand with the downtown clubs. Um, I'll answer your questions. I'm so sorry that I am not, I'm a little discombobulated, but it is a amazing experience and thank you all. Yeah, sorry. there's no need to apologize at all. Really, it's totally fine. Um, you know, I, oftentimes we, in, in these downtown clubs, we like, uh, to elect people who inspire change and who, um, you know, lead that, lead that, that, that path. Um, so it's nice that we can return that to the people that we put into office and into different positions, or I don't want to say put, that's a very bad way to put it, that we help support get into those roles. Um, so it's really nice to hear that, uh, that we had that, you know, the clubs had such a profound impact on your life because usually it's the other way around. Um, so, you know, for all of the candidates that are here, uh, if you get our support, know that it means it's because you've earned it uh, through your work, through who you are, 
through your visions. Um, we don't, at least I know at VID and based on what I've seen at the other clubs um, and talking to the other leaders, we don't, you know, give away our endorsements because people deserve it for any reason. It's, it's earned. Um, so if, if you've gotten an endorsement from us in the past, if you're getting an endorsement from us, you should feel good about that because uh, you earned it. And there's, there's no reason that any person shouldn't be able to um, if they do the right work and if they, their heart's in the right place. So um, with that, I'll get the, uh, the questions started. Um, so please raise your questions if you have any for Duran and I'll, I'll ask my first question. Um, what is the role of New York's elected judiciary in perpetuating mass incarceration? And without making any comment about a specific case, how would that inform your judicial philosophy? <clears throat> I mean, very, I mean, very few people find themselves in a incarceratory situation without a court having been involved in some way, shape, or form. Um, so obviously the courts play the most central role. Um, when I started Legal Aid Society, I remember one of the most interesting things to me and kind of depressingly interesting thing. I was in I was in the Manhattan at 100 Center Street and I noticed that any bails that were set were never lower than $500. And I was informed later that a lot of judges and so I guess the practice in Manhattan, $500 was considered nuisance bail. And I'm standing there as an attorney going, you know, if I had to come up with $500 for bail right now, <laughs> there might be some trouble. And so again, sometimes there's this disconnect between what people think is nuisance and what is prohibitive. I have seen people who could not afford the $500 and were stuck sitting in jail or sitting at Rikers for cases where the prosecutor wasn't even asking for a jail sentence. And so, but they couldn't plead guilty to the thing. And so what choice do they have? I mean, that's a rock and a hard place issue. I think that as a court, you need to be aware of the situation. A lot of people just simply forget that, that a lot of Rikers are people there who have not been convicted of anything. They're there on bail. And we need to remember that the purpose of bail is to ensure that someone returns to court and that's it. You know, you hear a lot of stuff in the news about, you know, bail reform and their concerns. The purpose of bail is to ensure someone's return to court. All of these processes, will you come back? Everything else is irrelevant to the bail discussion. So when you hear, even in court, people talking about, oh, they have these convictions from the past. What does that have to do about whether you come back? Right. So the question, so I think that in the courtroom, the, the things that the judge should be allowing the lawyers to talk about is the stuff that's relevant. And so I think that that's one big part in terms of people who are incarcerated who haven't even been convicted of a crime, but have to basically decide, am I going to plead guilty to something I maybe I didn't even do, get a criminal record my entire life just to get out, or do I grin and bear sitting in jail while someone with just a little more money or connections or authority or a, a job that they can write down because they don't have to work under the table, they get to be out. And now what you're seeing in the news is that the fact that someone who is poor has the opportunity to not be in jail, just like someone who is rich has always had that opportunity, people are complaining that that's unfair. Well, I don't think that that's unfair. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, I'm still yeah, trying to make right. my brain work again. But. <laughs> you're good, you're good, you're good. Uh, Rick Braun. Yeah, hi again. I remember you very well from last year. And what a difference a year made, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I should warn, because some, some people have been calling and asking me about this. I do look very different. Um, since you <laughs> saw me last year, I've lost about 130 pounds. Oh, wow. That's so not what I, I am a much smaller person. I just want to bring that up, not because of your question, but some people were kind of worried, like, are you know, is something going on? I've been intermittent fasting. And yes, I am much healthier and I feel much better. My waist size is what it was in my 20s. So this is <laughs> really exciting. <I'm>, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm sorry to uh, interrupt. Go ahead. I, I, no, that's fine. I appreciate what you just said. Now, I remember last year, your demeanor was different. If I recollect correctly, you're very serious. I strongly and, and proudly supported you last year. And I'm so happy for you this year. And and I appreciate your emotions. 
and I'm glad that you're going to be getting the position. And I just want to give you that feedback. I have no question. Congratulations. Thank you. I guess the one thing is I want to get this out because I don't want to be like this, you know, on the bench. If I'm blessed <laughs> to make it all the way through, I don't want my first day up there to be like this. So <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Uh, we'll have Jen, because uh, she hasn't spoken, and then E. e. Keenan after that. Thank you for unmuting me. Um, Duran, I wanted to say congratulations since I didn't get to say that the other night. Um, but I also was really struck this past week um, as a district leader who uh, was on those those meetings, both the, the um, reception and our meeting the other night um, with uh, your special guest who you had with you. Um, and I uh, and I think I was especially struck by that because I um, spend uh, more than 15 years of my life um, doing work for Big Brothers Big Sisters. So um, I was wondering if you could tell everyone on the Zoom a little bit about that relationship and who was there with you. Oh, Jay Fern. <laughs> um, his name is Jonathan Fernandez. He was actually a student of mine at BMCC in 2019. Um, he took me for statistics. He's actually into in the finance, he's, he's getting in more and more into the finance world, actually, that's his interest. And he, I don't, you know, sometimes I tell him, like, I don't know why I like you, but <laughs> we just grew, like, he turned into, like, a little brother, a son, a nephew. He has, we have been in contact. I've worked with him on some actually, actually more deeper math. And in fact, we were talking just earlier this week about logarithmic growth, because that plays a role with a lot of economic stuff with exponential functions and whatnot. We just, and last year, he literally asked, he goes, oh, you're going to, the, I want to go. So he joined me last year and he sat there with me and he was the first to congratulate me. And this year when I said, oh, I have to go do that meeting. He goes, oh, what time should I be there? And he was, <laughs> so I didn't have much say in that matter, but he, he's just, he's a great kid. He's 20, he was 19 when we met. He's 21, he's 22 now, sorry. And, you know, the rest is history. So he's just been there with me and for me. And, you know, I, I, you know, as an educator, as a judge, I do expect to still work with interns and, you know, kids and, you know, be it math, be it law, be it any intersection of them or anything else I could be of advice, you know, of support or advice for saying, yo, you can do this. Okay. Be patient with yourself. You can do, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to do so. And trust me, I get rewarded way more than I could ever get as I'm sure you know from Big Brothers Big Sisters. Thanks, guys. Uh, we have Catherine Wolpe and then E. e. Keenan. So Catherine, please take it away. Um, obviously, a lot of people here know you, but for those who are not acquainted with you, could you give a brief summary of your career and experience? Yes, I, I do apologize. <laughs> Um, so I came into law, not directly. I was, um, I was a math major, you know, undergrad, grad school. I um, was a math professor. In fact, August of this year will be my 25 year anniversary as a mathematics educator. I taught my very first class at University of Michigan in the fall of 1997. Um, I went to law school actually in my early 30s, um, interested in some mathematical applications of the law, but becoming ever more curious and interested about the law on its own as I studied it. So when I graduated from law school in 2010, I joined the Legal Aid Society as a public defender. I knew I wanted to do public interest work. Everyone was trying to get me to go and do, you know, white shoe or major law firms. They go with your math background and law. Everyone's going to want you. I, did, I have no interest sitting around dealing with just those numbers the way they wanted me to, you know, just checking contracts for commas and stuff <laughs> as a litigator. That was not my interest then. Um, so I went public interest. I wanted to be in the courtroom. I wanted to do trial work. And then I got into the appellate work. And then, as I said, I, I became a court attorney. I was at Legal Aid Society till 2017 when I became a court attorney um, for a trial judge. And then a year and a half later, November of 2018, I was hired as a court attorney for the appellate term second department where I work to this day. And so, as I've said to some of you, 
I'm a bit of a unicorn in that I actually have both trial and appellate level experience as both a litigator with the Legal Aid Society and as a member of the judiciary as a court attorney. I'm really comfortable with how the, I know how the court system works. I'm not comfortable with everything. I know how it works. I am comfortable with what it takes to be a judge and that the work I'm doing is basically behind the scenes, the work of a judge. I'm just asking to be allowed to do the same work at the forefront. And I'm very comfortable with and familiar with the type of, you know, writing that's necessary, persuasive writing, persuasive arguing that's necessary to explain to the litigants why I ruled the way I ruled, to explain to fellow judges why they should agree with me in their rulings, and to explain to the appellate courts, should I, you know, when, when and if I'm appealed, why they should affirm my view of the law and its application. So I am ready to hit the ground running in a lot of respects. Thank you very much. Um, and that's all the time we have. We really appreciate you coming by. Um, and it's yeah, I thank you all more than you ever know. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, we're, we're, we're happy to have you. We're very excited. Um, and we wish you nothing but success. And uh, we hope to see, you know, more people uh, get opportunity anywhere, any position, get, get opportunities they didn't think were possible. And we're, we're very glad to be a part of that for sure. Yeah, thank you. All right, so next up we have Carmen Pacheco. Uh, so please unmute yourself. And uh, Carmen passed along something to drop in the chat. So I'm gonna drop that in now so you all can see. Thank you very much. My name is Carmen Pacheco and I am running for Supreme Court Judge in District 2 in Manhattan. Because I have decades of experience as an attorney doing litigation and transactional work. I was recently reported out of the Manhattan Democratic Screening Panel as most highly qualified. And I thank them and I thank the screening panels and I thank all of them. I started the first Hispanic woman on law firm in New York at One World Trade Center in 1992 in order to level the playing field between big business and Main Street. My mother is from Puerto Rico and my father's from Peru. I am a native New Yorker born in Manhattan and raised in public housing, NYCHA. I am a graduate of CUNY, Brooklyn College and St. John's University School of Law, where I graduated oh. as a published member of the St. John's Law Review. I am also published in the Federal Rules of Decision. I have written the MECI briefs to the United States Supreme Court concerning issues against ultra funding individuals and companies and double jeopardy and its application to Puerto Rican citizens. I started my legal career in Manhattan and stayed in Manhattan until 2003, where I opened a storefront office here in Brooklyn. So that just with a ring of a doorbell, my doors are open to everyone. I don't need to have a listening tour as to what's going on in Main Street. I know I am the person who stands and defends Main Street. And that's my practice. My volunteerism has mostly been in legal settings, representing clients pro bono, providing sliding scale fees for legally indigent people, and even no fees at times, serving bar associations, including being elected as the president of the Puerto Rican Bar Association in 2017, providing hundreds and thousands, it was actually $172,000 worth of scholarships to underprivileged individuals who cannot afford law school. It's law school's expensive. And I am the district leader for the New York State Bar Association trial lawyers. Now let's get to some specifics. After Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico and all that Trump could do was throw a towel to our people. I raised funds. I purchased water, we purchased water, generators, we coalesced a lot of the bar associations across the country, and we delivered it to individuals residing in the mountaintops of Puerto Rico. And I provided with our team legal services concerning FEMA going into the mountains and helping in um, connecting people with, with cellular phones or, or satellite phones to. to provide them with legal services, much needed. Uh, the Puerto Rican Bar Association and many other bar associations, we help them 
when they were they had no electricity, we bought you know we bought generators. It's so important so that the Colegio de Abogados could provide legal services to women in areas of domestic violence, which was plaguing in Puerto Rico for in certain towns. So we helped them get on their feet. I have also worked representing and incorporating local community-based organizations like Asian Americans for Equality, Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Peruvian Commerce uh, Chambers, so Mexican small businesses, 100 Hispanic women, Spanish-speaking elderly, and Hispanic elder Eloisaida, enabling them to do their work to assist the low-income individuals and people of color. And I mentor many people, and we, you know, we help. Decades ago, I represented the family of Rosie Mendez, the former councilwoman of the Lower East Side, when her, her aunt, um, Maximiliana, the matriarch of her family, passed away from lung cancer and was buried in contaminated sections of Cypress Hill Cemetery. The case was a matter of racial injustice because it affected the African-American community, Latinos and Asians, that they were getting plots that were in garbage. Many of the families were removed 30 seconds. And, and reinterred, and the attorney general did nothing, but we made sure that they were having that their day so that they didn't have to pay for it. I have the experience and knowledge and the compassion to serve as a school court judge. I hope that I can get your support and endorse in this race. Also, thank all of you for attending and those who are participating for your interest and your commitment to the most important position of judge, which is a critical part to the access to justice. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. Um, oh, thank so I'll you. Start, yeah, of course, so I'll start off with the same question you've been asking everybody else. Uh, what is the role of New York's elected judiciary in perpetuating mass incarceration? And without making any comment about a specific case, how would that inform your, ju your judicial philosophy? I mentioned earlier that I, um, you know, I was raised in NYCHA. So I've always believed in cash bail reform. Cash bail unjustly punishes people by abridging their liberties of those economically disadvantaged. It's clear. The system is changing and I'm happy about it because when someone can't afford to pay, they are some, they're extracted from their families because they don't want to take that guilty plea. Uh, then they're released. Later, they lose their jobs. That's the wrong message. To have someone to plea guilty for a crime because they have to get to work. And by changing all of this inequality, you know, it's, it is the, the culture of the DA's office, it depends. Uh, that kind of change is important. And you have to change the culture, not only in the DA's office, but all around in the criminal system. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, we'll start off with David, then E. Keenan, then Paul Newell, and then Carla. Uh, it's nice to meet you. Um, I, I apologize, I'm not as familiar with this race as I was hoping to be by the time of this meeting, but I did uh, look you up online. And the first thing that popped up was an article from last year that said, uh, lifelong Brooklynite runs for civil court in Brooklyn. I'm wondering uh, why you chose this year to run for this particular district in Manhattan. First of all, the way the judicial system works, you could live anywhere and be in the five boroughs. The Law East Sida, the way I understand it is, in downtown Manhattan has a lot of Latinos. And that's who I service as a great deal, not only Latinos, but African-Americans and Asians and people of, of, of color. I mean, this is, this, is, this is in my wheelhouse. It was also the underrepresented here in New York and also the economically disadvantaged. So when you're looking at places where there is NYCHA housing, which is important, they need access to justice too. And that's why I'm running as a judge. Because I truly believe that the door should be open to everyone. And that's the culture that has to be put into every single courtroom, every DA's office, every, every law firm, everybody should be giving back because you know what is? To be practicing as a lawyer is a gift and it's a blessing. And you should pay that forward to everybody. And I do that every single day. 
I have my boots to the ground. And I truly believe that access to justice starts with the practitioner and it moves into the courtroom. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much. Um, so next we have E. Keenan, then Paul Newell, then Carla, and then Marianne. Good afternoon, Ms. Pacheco. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, what are the attributes to make for good judicial demeanor and do you have them? Well, first thing is to be able to listen. You have to listen to the person so that they feel that, they, that they've been heard. Listen, justice has to be brought, right? But it's my philosophy, it's about time that they see and hear us because that's mainstream. So the thing is patience goes with hearing someone you have, they have to feel that they have been seen and that they've been given due process. That's important. And that, look, my thoughts are, it's the courtroom is the taxpayers. We pay our tax dollars. It's not my courtroom. It's not anyone else's courtroom. It's the courtroom of the people. We pay for that. So those doors need to be open to everyone. No matter how big, they have a real access or how small, but the person on Main Street should never feel small. The door should be open. So you need to be able to listen, see, and hear the people, and most importantly, read the papers. You have to be able to understand what's in front of you. And if you don't, take a break and you do something to learn about the case. But it's so important to be heard. So judicial demeanor, patience, patience, understanding, those are two big things. And having good knowledge of the law so that you could be able to impart justice to whoever is in front of you and that they feel that the justice system has not failed them. But you need to trust the justice system. I think that things are moving away from that. You need to have more trust in the system. I think that, you know, from where I sit, I, I, I do it. But I think that the doors really have to be open to the whole system of justice. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Paul, then Carla, then Marion. Um, thank you, Ms. Pacheco, for joining us and for your years of work. Um, so my question, I, I apologize if this sounds like a gotcha question. It is really not intended to be. It's a thing going around that I'd like to hear you respond to. Um, and that is that um, it is my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you own a building along with your former law partner, who is now a civil court uh, judge herself, um, uh, that was placed on a list of the public advocates list of slumlord buildings, top 100 slumlord buildings a couple of years ago. Um, obviously, tenants' rights are very important in the Lower East Side. Just wanted to hear your explanation and reasoning of what happened. How that start is no good deed goes unpunished. There was a building that, um, that I bought, my business partner, and I'm glad that you asked the questions to get it out of the way. And it was um, one tenant that decided to do a lot of things and we just let him stay there and we took care of him. We didn't know rent was charged at all. And he lived there, he had um, a condition. So we helped him. But then I, I guess his, his, his mental condition really wasn't, and it happens, I get it. You know, so I ended up getting the brunt of it. But the courts refused, the HPD didn't want to represent him at all. The land, you know, the lawyers didn't want to represent him. Uh, he still stayed, because, you know, he, it's just what you do, it's a human being. And ultimately he did leave. You know, he, he did do a lot of bad things in the building, but it is what it is. You have to have compassion. And that's part of being a judge. And we had the compassion there. We lived there for many years. And we, and we, in a sense, helped him. He put a lot of violations on the building. He, you know, the record speaks for itself. The records clearly stated that 
you know, he, um, you know, that HPD even real, I mean, the, re the record speaks that HPD realized that we were good people and that we didn't want to throw him out because, we, you know, the courts did want to replace, move him. And we said, no. And we suffered that. There's no do good deed goes unpunished. But you know what? I don't regret it. Because in my heart, I did the right thing. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Carla. If hey, Judge. Still... Uh, you're muted, Carla. Uh, Carla, you're still muted. Muted. How's you're that? Good now. Yep. I was very aware when I when I um, ran for civil court way back in the 19, whatever, 1982, that there were very few women on the bench at that time. And I thought it was important to have more women on the bench. Now I see that there are very few minorities on the bench. And I think, I think it's equally important now for litigants to see, particularly in the civil court and criminal court, to see people like them on the bench. And is that, I mean, I don't even know how many Hispanic um, Hispanics there are on the civil court bench or the criminal court bench. Do you in Manhattan? Did I speak? Did anybody hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we got you. We got you. Good. I mean, because that was something that I saw as a real problem for for people coming before the court. Now I wanted to know what's going on now. I think that there is um, in Manhattan there are no Latinos sitting on the civil court bench. Uh, at all. Uh, Does that want to put that away? And, um, what about Betty Luger? Could I she, watch she, she came out of, yeah, but she's now in Brooklyn. She's sitting in Brooklyn. Oh, okay. But there's no one in, in Manhattan. I think it is so important to have diversity all around because how people think, how America thinks, here we are, Brooklynites with Democrats, you know, we, 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 we care about other people. But when you bring people together, it's been my experience sitting on various boards, whether it's um, a board for young people or a board for the community-based organizations. I think it's so important that when people come together and they talk about things, you see how things change. Because I come in with a different perspective. I come in with a perspective of what I was raised. I was raised in NYCHA, then I, you know, I, I moved, we moved elsewhere, my family. My father's from Peru. He, you know, went through a lot of discrimination because he had a heavy accent. You know, even up to to when he when he passed away, the same thing. You know, and how the funeral homes treated him because he had gone to Florida to, um, you know, to to take care of some things for the family, and then he dies over there. And then in Florida, in in Bradenton, Florida, they they made a funny phone call. So when you see these things bring your life experiences to the courtroom. You see that person in civil court who needs extra. So you take that moment. You, I, I think that they should have social workers as part of the system. It's so important to help people that way because that shows that the courtrooms are open to everyone. And as a Latina, I, I, you know, we, we embrace that because we bring our culture to the table and we teach people different things because we have different experiences. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for coming by and speaking to us today. It was great meeting you. It was my pleasure. And listen, thank everyone, the participants and everyone here. And I truly thank you from the bottom of my heart. This is such a, an important moment. Thank you. Thanks. Take it easy. All right. So um, last up, we have Anna Mikaleva, um, who will just be introducing herself. Um, so Anna, please, you have five minutes. Okay. Um, awesome. Thank you. Thank you for making the time. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Good, good afternoon. Um, so I'm not going to keep you here too long. It's been a long afternoon. It's Saturday. It's been a long week for most of you. Um, I just wanted to say hello and tell you a little bit about myself. Um, this is my first time running for civil court um, in the last couple of years have been um, not the easiest for getting to know people with all the 
uh, restrictions and lack of uh, in-person events. I'm looking forward to the old normal returning hopefully soon. Um, I work in the appellate division first department with Judge Jeffrey Oing. Um, it's a, a wonderful job. I'm his principal court attorney. I get to work on every kind of case that comes through the unified court system from family court matters, criminal, civil, surrogates, you name it. Um, I love my job because I get to come to work and try to do the right thing every single day. I hope to continue to do something like that when, um, if I'm lucky enough to be elected as a judge at some point. Um, prior to the first department, I uh, worked in a Supreme Court in Manhattan. I started off there um, on a very, um, was supposed to be temporary uh, public service fellowship with Judge Ira Gammerman. And um, I had such a great time with Judge Gammerman and we got on so well that my temporary fellowship turned into, um, you know, a years long commitment. And I've never wanted to do anything else because I really uh, value public service and the opportunities that it gives me to try to do the right thing. Um, I want to be a judge because I want to make a difference. Uh, that might sound a little simplistic and corny, but I really think um, that judges can do a lot. And having worked in the courts for over 12 years, I've seen firsthand what a difference a good judge can make. Um, you know, a lot has been said um, in this uh, past couple of months, I think, about how the one good thing about the pandemic is that it's forced the court system to modernize a little bit. People are permitted to appear virtually now. Um, we've had virtual trials, virtual arguments. It, it saves litigants time, it saves them money. It affords people who are self-represented an opportunity to come to court without having to sacrifice a day of work. Um, but as a court attorney, you know, I've always tried to give that to people well before that was something that was permitted by UC as officially. You know, we always tried to communicate by email. I always gave people my phone number. If somebody had nothing to discuss because all of their, you know, milestones were met and they needed to just tell us that they're filing, you know, their certificate of readiness for trial, I would save them that trip. I would say, please reach out, let us know. Um, so I think there's a lot that um, you can do as a judge. And that's one of the things that I would like to accomplish if I'm lucky enough to be elected. I was really um, humbled and honored to be reported out as highly qualified this year. I am not running this time around, but I hope that I will be able to run um, officially uh, next year or sometime in the near future. And I hope that I get to know you better um, and be able to be more involved. And I hope that I can count on your support in the years down the line. Thank you. Thank you so much. We look forward to getting to know you as well. And congratulations on getting reported out. Of course. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Well, um, that is it for our candidates today. Uh, an immense thank you to everybody for coming out and speaking to our club members and uh, telling us a little bit about yourself and answering uh, the, in some cases, tough and in other cases, not as tough questions. Um, we look forward to, to uh, working with some of you and um, continue to see your faces. Uh, big thank you to Richard and Mar who weren't here today, but did a lot of work helping to plan this forum. Uh, to Meg, my co-host, a, a big thank you. I absolutely would not have been able to make this run in any way smoothly without you. And to Susan for keeping time for us.